Good day to all of you. So we're already on the chapter 8 of William Stallings Computer Organization and Architecture 10th edition. So it's all about the operating system support. So although the focus of our lesson is computer hardware, there is one area of software that needs to be addressed, the computer's OS or the operating system. So the OS is a program that manages the computer's resources, provides services for programmers, and schedules the execution of other programs. Some understanding of operating systems is essential to appreciate the mechanisms by which the CPU controls the computer system. In particular, explanations of the effect of interrupts and of the management of the memory hierarchy are best explained in this context. So the chapter begins with an overview and brief history of operating systems. The bulk of the chapter looks at the two OS functions that are most relevant to the study of computer organization and architecture, which is the scheduling and memory management. So let's start our lesson with figure 8.1, which is about computer hardware and software structure. So an OS is a program that controls the execution of application programs and acts as an interface between applications and the computer hardware. It can be thought of as having two objectives. So first objective of having OS is convenience. An OS makes a computer more convenient to use. Next is efficiency. An OS allows the computer system resources to be used in an efficient manner. So the hardware and software used in providing applications to a user can be viewed in a layered or hierarchical fashion as depicted in the figure. So the user of those applications, the end user, generally is not concerned with the computer's architecture because um, for the user, what's important to the user is how he or she is going to use the computer. He does not, he does not, or she does not concern with the background, what is happening at the background uh, while you're doing those applications. So thus the end user views a computer system in terms of an application. So how does, how does your computer is, how does your computer is used? For example, uh, the user used it for an office productivity. So because of the application that is installed in the computer. So that application can be expressed in a programming language and is developed by an application programmer. To develop an application program as a set of processor instructions that is completely responsible for controlling the computer hardware would be an overwhelmingly complex task. To ease this task, a set of systems programs is provided. Some of these programs are referred to as utilities. So these implement frequently used functions that assist in program creation, the management of files, and the control of the I.O. or input-output devices. A programmer makes use of these facilities in developing an application, and the application, while it is running, invokes the utilities to perform certain functions. So as we can see here in the figure in 8.1, and the user only accesses the application programs. Uh, they do not care whatever is happening between the libraries and utilities and, of course, in the operating system. Though, as we can see here, we have uh, there is also an interface between the application programs and the operating system. Actually, the user uh, can also access the operating system, but by means of its user interface. But the execution hardware, the system interconnect, the memory translation, and this I.O. devices and networking and main memory, the user is not concerned about it. For, for him or for her, it's really just important that the application programs are running based uh, on his or her needs. So next is we have, um, uh, let's discuss the operating system or the OS services. So the most important system program is the OS. The OS masks the details of the hardware from the programmer and provides the programmer with a convenient interface for using the system. It acts as a mediator, making it easier for the programmer and for application programs to access and use those facilities and services. Briefly, the OS typically provides services in the following areas. First is we have program creation. The OS provides a variety of facilities and services, such as editors and debuggers, to assist the programmer in creating programs. Typically, these services are in the form of utility programs that are not actually part of the OS but are accessible through the OS. Next is we have program execution. 
a number of steps need to be performed to execute a program. Instructions and data must be loaded into main memory, I.O. devices and files must be initialized, and other resources must be prepared. The OS handles all of this for the user. So for the user, um, program execution is just by means of clicking the icon of a particular application program. But what is happening after that click is what uh, is what uh is described in the program execution so actually again the user is not concerned of what is happening in the background as long as um, he or she click the icon of the application program and it will run so it's uh, it, uh, it is already enough for the user to use that particular application program next is we have access to io devices each io device requires its own specific set of instructions or control signals for operation the OS takes care of the details so that the programmer can think in terms of simple reads and writes. So as you can remember in Chapter 7, so we all about input-output, um, there are many different types of I.O. devices. So it requires a specific set of instructions, for example, for a keyboard, for a monitor, for a hard disk drive. So it has different commands. So um, the OS uh, will take care of those details. And then next is we have controlled access to files. In the case of files, control must include an understanding of not only the nature of the I.O. device, which as I've mentioned, uh, such as disk drive, tape drive, but also the file format on the storage medium. Again, the OS worries about the details. Further, in the case of a system with multiple simultaneous users, the OS can provide protection mechanisms to control access to the files. So next is we also have system access. In the case of a shared or public system, the OS controls access to the system as a whole and to specific system resources. The access function must provide protection of resources and data from unauthorized users and must resolve conflicts for resource contention. And then also we have error detection and response. A variety of errors can occur while a computer system is running. This include internal and external hardware errors, such as a memory error or a device failure or a malfunction, and various software errors, such as arithmetic overflow, attempt to access forbidden memory location, and ability of the OS to grant the request of an application. In each case, as uh, mentioned, these different types of errors, the OS must make the response that clears the error condition with the least impact on running applications. The response may range from ending the program that caused the error to retrying the operation to simply reporting the error to the application. And then next, we also have accounting. A good OS collects usage statistics for various resources and monitor performance parameters such as response time. On any system, this information is useful in anticipating the need for future enhancements and in tuning the system to improve performance. On a multi-user system, the information can be used for billing purposes. So these are the operating system services, the general services that is being offered by the operating system. So next is we have the interfaces. So, as you can remember, so figure 8.1 also indicates three key interfaces in a typical computer system. So, first is we have the instruction set architecture or the ISA. So, the ISA defines the repertoire of machine language instruction that a computer can follow. This interface is the boundary between hardware and software. Note that both application programs and utilities may access the ISA directly. For these programs, a subset of the instruction repertoire is available via user ISA. So the OS has access to additional machine language instructions that deal with managing system resources which are, uh, which are the system ISA. Next is we have Application Binary Interface or ABI. So the ABI defines a standard for binary portability across programs. The ABI defines the system call interface to the operating system and the hardware resources and services available in a system through the user ISA. And next is we have the application programming interface or the API. The API gives a program access to the hardware resources and services available in a system through the user ISA supplemented with high-level language or HLL library calls. Any system calls are usually performed through 
libraries. Using an API enables application software to be ported easily through recompilation to other systems that support the same API. So next is we have an operating system or the OS as a resource manager. So a computer is a set of resources for the movement, storage, and processing of data and for the control of these functions. The OS is responsible for managing these resources. Can we say that the OS controls the movement, storage, and processing of data? So from one point of view, the answer is yes. By managing the computer's resources, the OS is in control of the computer's basic functions, but this control is exercised in a curious way. Normally, we think of a control mechanism as something external to that which is controlled, or at at least as something that is a distinct and separate part that which is controlled. For example, a residential heating system is controlled by a thermostat, which is completely distinct from the heat generation and heat distribution apparatus. This is not the case with the OS, which as a control mechanism is unusual in two respects. First is, the OS functions in the same way as an ordinary computer software. Actually, OS is considered as a software. That is, it is a program executed by the processor. And then the OS frequently relinquishes control and must depend on the processor to allow it to regain control. Like other computer programs, the OS provides instructions for the processor. The key difference is in the intent of the program. The OS directs the processor in the use of the other system resources and in the timing of its execution of other programs. But in order for the processor to do any of these things, it must cease executing the OS program and execute other programs. Thus, the OS relinquishes control for the processor to do some useful work and then resumes control long enough to prepare the processor to do the next piece of work. The mechanisms involved in all this should become as clear as we uh, delve with our lesson. So next is we have the next figure. We have figure 8.2, which is the operating system as a resource manager. So this figure suggests the main resources that are managed by the OS. A portion of the OS is in main memory. So that's why, because it's in main memory, since main memory is volatile, if there's a power outage, it's not, uh, if you're going to turn on the computer, it will be the OS at the same time, but it will still boot. So that's why um, the OS also resides in the memory. So this includes the kernel or nucleus which contains the most frequently used functions in the OS and at a given time, other portions of the OS currently in use. The remainder of main memory contains user programs and data. The allocation of these resources such as main memory is controlled jointly by the OS and memory management hardware in the processor. So the OS decides when an I.O. device can be used by a program in execution and controls access to and use of files. The processor itself is a resource and the OS must determine how much processor time is to be devoted to the execution of a particular user program. In the case of a multi-processor system, this decision must span all of the processors. So next is we have, as we can see, these are the as resource manager. It controls the, uh, the memory and also the processor. And then what are the types of the operating systems? So certain key characteristics serve to differentiate various types of operating systems. The characteristics fall along two independent dimensions. The first dimension specifies whether the system is batch or interactive. In an interactive system, the user or programmer interacts directly with the computer, usually through a keyboard or display terminal, to request the execution of a job or to perform a transaction. Furthermore, the user may, depending on the nature of the application, communicate with the computer during the execution of the job. So actually, our computers nowadays with the operating system, most of them or all of them actually are interactive systems. So on the other hand, a batch system is the opposite of interactive. The user's program is batched together with programs from other users and submitted by a computer operator. After the program is completed, results are printed out for the user. Pure batch systems are rare today. 
However, it will be useful to the description of contemporary operating systems to examine batch systems briefly. An independent dimension specifies whether the system employs multi-programming or not. With multi-programming, the attempt is made to keep the processor busy as possible by having it work on more than one program at a time. Several programs are loaded into memory and the processor switches rapidly among them. The alternative is a uni-programming system that works only one program at a time. So, multi-programming is also called multitasking. For example, um, you are doing your project or your um, term paper using word processor while listening to music. Why is it possible that you can, um, you can type, for example, the entries on your term paper while listening to music or while watching a, a movie from a video player or browsing an internet if you can do that all the time it's because the computer um, is programmed as a multi-programming scheme or it, it has something to do with multitasking so it can um, execute actually it's not executing all the programs at once but uh, there are ex uh, there are um, ra uh, the processor rapidly switches from one program to another for example if you are uh, typing your term paper so the active program is the word processor and the background for example is a music player so since uh, the priority is the uh, word processor so it this is the active program but then again um, it switches from the music player and uh, the the word the word processor but of course we cannot uh, discern it because uh, the computer works in gigahertz or in nanoseconds, so um, we can never know that, that the processor really switches from one program to another. So what if uh, there are uh, multiple cores? So there is an instance that it's possible, for example, that one core handles the, um, the word processor while the other core handles the music and other application programs. Okay, so before that, so let's have a history of how does the operating system uh, at, an er at an early day. So the early systems, so with the earliest computers from the late 1940s to the mid-1950s, so uh, the programmer interacted directly with the computer hardware. There was no OS. So these processors were run from a console consisting of display lights, toggle switches, some form of input device, and a printer. Programs in processor code were loaded via the input device such as a card reader. If an error halted the program, the error condition was indicated by the lights. The programmer could proceed to examine registers in main memory to determine the cause of the error. If the program proceeded to a normal completion, the output appeared on the printer. So these early systems presented two main problems. So first is we have the scheduling. So most installations used a sign-up sheet to reserve processor time. Typically, a user could sign up for a block of time in multiples of a half hour or so. A user might sign up for an hour and finish in 45 minutes. This would result in wasted computer idle time. Um, 15 minutes is, you can do already many things in 15 minutes. So on the other hand, the user might run into problems, not finish in the allotted time, and be forced to stop before resolving the problem. So another problem is also the setup time. A single program called a job could involve loading the compiler plus the high-level language program, which is the source program, into memory, saving the compiled program or the object program, and then loading and linking together the object program and common functions. Each of these steps could involve mounting or dismounting tapes or setting up card decks. If an error occurred, the hapless user typically had to go back to the beginning of the setup sequence. Thus, a considerable amount of time was spent just in setting up the program to run. So this mode of operation could be termed serial processing, reflecting the fact that users have access to the computer in series. Over time, various system software tools were developed to attempt to make serial processing more efficient. So this include libraries of common functions, linkers, loaders, debuggers, and I.O. driver routines that were available as common software for all users. So next is we have figure 8.3, which is all about the memory layout for a residential monitor. 
So early processors were very expensive and therefore it was important to maximize processor utilization. The wasted time due to scheduling and setup was unacceptable. So to improve utilization, simple batch operating systems were developed. With such a system, also called a monitor, the user no longer has direct access to the processor. Rather, the user submits the job on cards or tape to a computer operator who batches the jobs together sequentially and places the entire batch on an input device for use by the monitor. To understand how this scheme works, let us look at it from two points of view, that of the monitor and that of the processor. From the point of view of the monitor, the monitor controls the sequence of events. For this to be so, much of the monitor must always in the main memory and available for execution as can be seen in this figure. So that portion is referred to as the resident monitor. The rest of the monitor consists of utilities and common functions that are loaded as subroutines to the user program at the beginning of any job that requires them. The monitor reads in jobs one at a time from the input device, typically a card reader or magnetic tape drive. As it is read in, the current job is placed in the user program area and control is passed to this job. When the job is completed, it returns control to the monitor which immediately reads in the next job. The results of each job are printed out for delivery to the user. So next is we have um, from the view of the processor. Now consider this sequence from the point of view of the processor because the previously we have discussed the from the viewpoint of the monitor. At a certain point in time, the processor is executing instructions from the portion of main memory containing the monitor. These instructions cause the next job to be read in to another portion of main memory. Once a job has been read in, the processor will encounter in the monitor a branch instruction that instructs the processor to continue execution at the start of the user program. The processor will then execute the instruction in the user's program until it encounters an ending or error condition. Either event causes the processor to fetch its next instruction from the monitor program. Thus, the phrase, control is passed to a job, simply means that the processor is now fetching and executing instructions in a user program and control is returned to the monitor means that the processor is now fetching and executing instructions from the monitor program. It should be clear that the monitor handles the scheduling problem. A batch of jobs is queued up and jobs are executed as rapidly as possible with no intervening idle time. But how about the job setup routine? So the monitor handles this as well. With each job, Instructions are included in a job control language or JCL. This is a special type of programming language used to provide instructions to the monitor. A simple example is that of a user submitting a program written in Fortran plus some data to be used by the program. Each Fortran instruction in each item of the data is on a separate punched card or separate record on tape. In addition to Fortran and data lines, the job includes job control instructions which are denoted by beginning with a dollar sign. To execute this job, the monitor reads the dollar sign FTN line and loads the appropriate compiler from its mass storage, usually the tape. The compiler translates the user's program into object code which is stored in memory or mass storage. If it is stored in memory, the operation is referred to as compile, load, and go. If it is stored on tape, then the dollar sign load instruction is required. So this instruction is read by the monitor, which regains control after the compile operation. The monitor invokes the loader, which loads the object program into memory in place of the compiler and transfers control to it. In this manner, a large segment of main memory can be shared among different subsystems, although only one such subsystem could be resident and executing at a time. We see that the monitor or batch OS is simply a computer program. It relies on the ability of the processor to fetch instructions from various portions of main memory in order to seize and relinquish control alternately. And then next is we have what are the desirable hardware features. So we have uh, certain other hardware features are also desirable such as memory protection. 
So while the user program is executing, it must not alter the memory area containing the monitor. If such an attempt is made, the processor hardware should detect an error and transfer control to the monitor. The monitor would then abort the job, print out an error message, and load the next job. Next is we have timer. So a timer is used to prevent a single job from monopolizing the system. The timer is set at the beginning of each job. If timer expires, an interrupt occurs and control returns to the monitor. Next is we have privileged instructions. Certain instructions are designed privileged and can be executed only by the monitor. If the processor encounters such an instruction while executing a user program, an error interrupt occurs. Among the privileged instructions are I.O. instructions so that the monitor retains control of all I.O. devices. This prevents, for example, a user program from accidentally reading job control instructions from the next job. If a user program wishes to perform I.O., it must request that the monitor perform the operation for it. If a privileged instruction is encountered by the processor while it is executing a user program, the processor hardware considers this an error and transfers control to the monitor. And then next is we have interrupts. Early computer models did not have this capability. So this feature gives the OS more flexibility in relinquishing control to and regaining control from the user programs. So the processor time alternates between execution of user programs and execution of the monitor. There have been two sacrifices. So first is some main memory is now given over to the monitor and some processor time is consumed by the monitor. Both of these are forms of overhead. Even with this overhead, the simple batch system improves utilization of the computer. So we have this figure in figure 8.4 system utilization example. So, even with the automatic job sequencing provided by a simple batch OS, the processor is often idle. The problem is that I.O. devices are slow compared to the processor. So, this figure details a representative calculation. The calculation concerns a program that processes a file of records and performs an average 100 processor instructions per record. So in this example, the computer spends over 96% of its time waiting for the I.O. devices to finish transferring data. So next is we have another figure. So from this description, we have figure 8.5a uh, illustrates the situation. So this is figure 8.5 which is multi-programming example so for letter a which is that is uniprogramming and then we have letter b multi-programming with two programs we have a and b and then multi-programming with three programs a b and c so the processor spends a certain amount of time executing while it reaches an io instruction it must then wait until that io instruction concludes before proceeding this efficiency is not necessary. We know that there must be enough memory to hold the OS or the resident monitor in one user program. Suppose that there is no room for the OS and two user programs. Now, when job, one job needs to wait for the I.O., the processor can switch to the other job, which is likely not waiting for the I.O., which is 8.5b. And then... Furthermore, we might expand memory to hold three, four, or more programs and switch among all of them in 8.5c. So this technique is known as multi-programming or multi-tasking. So it is the central theme of modern operating systems. So as with a simple batch system, a multi-programming batch system must rely on certain computer hardware features. So the most notable additional feature that is useful for multi-programming is the hardware that supports I.O. interrupts and DMA. With interrupt-driven I.O. or DMA, the processor can issue an I.O. command for one job and proceed with the execution of another job while waiting the I.O. is carried out by the device controller. When the I.O. operation is complete, the processor is interrupted and control is passed to an interrupt handling program in the OS. So the OS will then pass control to another job. So let's go back here with the figure 
for letter A, which is uniprogramming, so you can only run one program at a time. So this is very inefficient because what if it needs for an I.O.? So while the program is running, it needs to wait. And you see, uh, waiting time is longer than the running time. So it's very inefficient. While for multi-programming with two programs, first we run program A. And then, for example, it has a waiting state such as for I.O. devices. Since it's still in the waiting state, so the processor will process the next program, which is uh, B. And then what if, again, um, there is already a waiting time for program B, so both of this are in waiting state. And then after program A finishes in the waiting state, then the processor will switch back to program A. And then again, if, if the uh, program A again approaches waiting state, it will switch to program B. And then actually, this is also uh, the same with multi-programming. It just have the third program, which is C. So that's why multi-programming, multitasking, is that uh, the processor switches quickly from one program to another okay next is we have the table table 8.1 which is all about sample program execution attributes so this example illustrates the benefit of multi-programming as, as seen uh, in the previous figure consider a computer with 200 mega 250 megabytes of available memory so that is not used by the os a desk a terminal and a printer so three programs Job 1, Job 2, and Job 3 are submitted for execution at the same time with the attributes listed in the table as can be seen here for Job 1, Job 2, and Job 3. So we assume minimal processor requirements for Job 2 and Job 3 and continuous disk and printer use by Job 3. For a simple batch environment, these jobs will be executed in sequence. Thus, Job 1 completes in 5 minutes job 2 must wait until the 5 minutes is over and then completes 15 minutes after that and then job 3 begins after 20 minutes and completes at 30 minutes from the same it was initially submitted okay so next is another table so table 8.2 effects of multi-programming on resource utilization so the average resource utilization, throughput, and response times are shown in the uniprogramming column of this table. So device-by-device device utilization is illustrated in the next figure in 8.6a. It is evident that there is a gross underutilization for all resources when averaged over the required 30-minute time period. Now suppose that the jobs are run concurrently under a multi-programming OS. Because there is little resource contention between the jobs, all three can run in nearly minimum time while coexisting with the others in the computer, assuming that job 2 and job 3 are allotted enough processor time to keep their input and output operations active. Job 1 will require 5 minutes to complete but the end of that time, job 2 will be one-third finished and job 3 will be half finished. All three jobs will have finished within 15 minutes. The improvement is evident when examining the multi-programming column of this table obtained from the histogram shown in 8.6b. So, this is the figure of uh, utilization histograms. So, multi-programming operating systems are fairly sophisticated compared to single program or uniprogramming systems. To have several jobs ready to run, the jobs must be kept in main memory requiring some form of memory management. In addition, if several jobs are ready to run, the processor must decide which one to run, which requires some algorithm for scheduling. So these concepts are later discussed in our lesson for today. Okay, so we have here for uniprogramming and multiprogramming. Actually, you can compare it also with our example for uniprogramming while the program is running and then it it comes to our approaches to waiting state um, the processor time uh, will be wasted because it has to wait until it can run again that specific program okay so next is we have time sharing systems 
Okay, with the use of multi-programming, batch processing can be quite efficient. However, for many jobs, it is desirable to provide a mode in which the user interacts directly with the computer. Indeed, for some jobs, such as transaction processing, an interactive mode is essential. Today, the requirement for an interactive computing facility can be, and often is, met by the use of dedicated microcomputer. That option was not available in the 1960s, when most computers were big and costly. Instead, time sharing was developed. Just as multi-programming allows the processor to handle multiple batch jobs at a time, multi-programming can be used to handle multiple interactive jobs. In this later case, the technique is referred to as time sharing because the processor's time is shared among multiple users. In a time sharing system, Multiple users simultaneously access the system through terminals with the OS interleaving the execution of each user program in a short burst or quantum of computation. Thus, if there are n users actively requesting service at one time, each user will only see on the average of 1 over n of the effective computer speed, not counting OS overhead. However, given the relatively slow human reaction time, the response time on a properly designed system should be comparable to that on a dedicated computer. So actually, you can see time sharing system in servers. Okay, so next is we have another table for 8.3 batch multiprogramming versus time sharing. So both batch multiprogramming and time sharing use multiprogramming. So for Batch multiprogramming, the principal objective is maximize processor use while time sharing is minimize response time. And then source of directives to operating system, job control language commands provided with the job while for time sharing, commands entered at, at the terminal. And then next we have another table, table 8.4. We have types of scheduling. So the key to multi-programming is scheduling. In fact, four types of scheduling are typically involved as seen in the table. So we will ex explore this presently, but first, we introduce the concept of process. This term was first used by the designers of the Multix OS in the 1960s. It is somewhat more general term than job. Many definitions have been given for the term process, including... So, the most common definition of process is a program in execution or the animated spirit of a program or the entity to which a processor is assigned. So, first, let's tackle with, let's continue the discussion of the types of scheduling, which is first all about long-term scheduling. So, the long-term scheduler determines which programs are admitted to the system for processing. Thus, it controls the degree of multiprogramming or the number of processes in memory. Once admitted, a job or user program becomes a process and is added to the queue for the short-term scheduler. In some systems, a newly created process begins in a swapped-out condition, in which case it is added to a queue for the medium-term scheduler. In a batch system, or for the batch portion of a general purpose OS, newly submitted jobs are routed to disk and held in a batch queue. The long-term scheduler creates processes from the queue when it can. There are two decisions involved here. First, the scheduler must decide that the OS can take on one or more additional processes. Second, the scheduler must decide which job or jobs to accept and turn into processes. The criteria used may include priority, expected execution time, and I.O. requirements. For interactive programs in a time-sharing system, a process request is generated when a user attempts to connect to the system. Time-sharing users are not simply queued up and kept waiting until the system can accept them. Rather, the OS will accept all authorized corn commerce until the system is saturated using some predefined measure of saturation. At that point, a connection request is met with a message indicating that the system is full and the user should try again later. So aside from long-term scheduling is we have the medium-term scheduling and short-term scheduling. So medium-term scheduling is part of the swapping function as described and then typically the swapping indecision is based on the need to manage the degree of multiprogramming. On a system that does not use virtual memory, memory management is also an issue. 
Thus, the swapping in decision will consider the memory requirements of the swapped out processes. So the long-term scheduler executes relatively infrequently and makes coarse-grained decision of whether or not to take on a new process, which one to take. And then the short-term scheduler, also known as the dispatcher, executes frequently and makes the fine-grained decision of which job to execute next. So next is we have another figure. So we have a five-state process model. So to understand the operation of the short-term scheduler, we need to consider the concept of a process state. So during the lifetime of a process, its status will change a number of times. Its status at any point in time is referred to as a state. So the term state is used because it connotes that certain information exists that defines the status at that point. At minimum, there are five defined states for a process as depicted in figures 8.7. So we have first is the new. A program is admitted by the high-level scheduler but is not ready to execute. The OS will initialize the process, moving it to the ready state. Next is we have ready. The process is ready to execute and is waiting access to the processor. And then running. The process is being executed by the processor. Next is we have the waiting. And then the process is uh, suspended from execution waiting for some system resource such as I.O. So in our uh, um, example here, we have the blocked here. Actually, this is the waiting. And then we also have the halted. The process has terminated and will be destroyed by the OS, which is the exit. So for you to understand this example, if you're going to open a word processor, uh, clicking it, uh, it will be in new and ready. So by clicking only the, for example, the icon of the word processor, new and ready state is already working with that. And then after the compute, uh, after the word processor is loaded into memory, it is already running because it is already, it can be uh, used readily by the user. And then what if, for example, you're going to save your, uh, your for example, document for the first time? It, uh, there will be an appearance of a dialog box. So that dialog box is actually, and then you're going to type your uh, file name for your file. So that is already blocked or waiting. So that's why there is an uh, event uh, wait here. Then after saving, so we have again ready and then running again. And then if you're going to close already your word processor application program, and that will be your exit. So that is an example of the five-state process model. Uh, it's easier to understand if you're going to have an example uh, by using uh, an example by uh, using the computer system for typing, for example, a word processor to further understand this five-state process model. So next figure is we have figure 8.8. .8 the process control block. So for each process in the system, the OS must maintain information indicating the state of the process and other information necessary for process execution. For this purpose, each process is represented in the OS by a process control block or the PCB. A PC, uh, yes, PCB, as in the figure, which typically contains, first is we have, these are the parts of the PCB, the identifier, so each current process has a unique identifier. Next is we have the state. The current state of the process may be new, ready, and so on, as in the five-state process model. And then next is we have the priority. We have the relative priority level. And then we have the program counter, the address of the next instruction in the program to be executed. Next is we have memory pointers, the starting and ending locations of the process in memory, and then we have the context data. So these are data that are present in registers in the processor while the process is executing. And they will be discussed in other portions of our lesson. For now, it is enough to say that this data represent the context of the process. The context data plus the program counter are saved when the process leaves the running state. They are retrieved by the processor when it resumes execution of the process. Next is we have the I.O. status information. 
includes outstanding I.O. requests, I.O. devices such as tape drives assigned to this process, a list of files assigned to the process, and so on. And then we have accounting information. May include the amount of processor time and clock time used, time limits, account numbers, and so on. So when the scheduler accepts a new job or user request for execution, it creates a blank process control block and places the associated process in the new state. After the system has properly filled in the process control block, the process is transferred to the ready state. And then next is we have another figure, figure 8.9, is we have a scheduling example. So to understand how the OS manages the scheduling of the various jobs in memory, let us begin by considering the simple example in figure 8.9. We have A, B, and C. So the figure shows how main memory is partitioned at any given point in time. The kernel of the OS is, of course, always the resident. And then in addition, there are a number of active processes. So in our figure, we have A and B, each of which is allocated a portion of memory. We begin at a point in time when process A is running. So this is what this is the one A is running. The process is executing instructions from the program contained in A's memory partition. At some at some later point in time, the processor ceases to execute instructions in A and begins executing instructions in the OS area. So this will happen for one of three reasons. Process A issues a service call such as an I.O. request to the OS. Execution of A is suspended until this call is satisfied by the OS. Another is we have a process A causes an interrupt. An interrupt is a hardware-generated signal to the processor. When this signal is detected, the processor ceases to execute A and transfers to the interrupt handler in the OS. A variety of events related to A will cause an interrupt. One example is an error, such as attempting to execute a privileged instruction. Another example is a timeout. To prevent any one process from monopolizing the processor, each process is only granted the processor for a short period of time. And then next is number three, some event unrelated to the process A that requires attention causes an interrupt. An example is the completion of an I.O. operation. So in any case, the result is the following. The processor saves the context or the current context data and the program counter for A in A's process control block and then begins executing in the OS. The OS may perform some work such as initiating I.O. operation. Then the short-term scheduler portion of the OS decide which process should be executed next. In this example, B is chosen. So that's why uh, B is already ready here though. Uh, since it's already waiting and then B is chosen. So next is A is waiting for the I.O. request and then B is already running. So the OS instructs the processor to restore B's context data and proceed with the execution of B where it left off. So another figure is we have figure 8.10. So key elements of an operating system for multi-programming. So this simple example highlights the basic functioning of the short-term scheduler. So in this figure shows the major element of the OS involved in the multi-programming and scheduling of processes. The OS receives control of the processor at the interrupt handler if an interrupt occurs and at the service call handler if a service call occurs. Once the interrupt or service call is handled, the short-term scheduler is invoked to select a process for execution. To do its job, the OS maintains a number of queues. Each queue is simply a waiting list of processes waiting for some resource. The long-term queue is a list of jobs waiting to use the system. As conditions permit, the high-level scheduler will allocate memory and create a process for one of the waiting items. The short-term queue consists of all processes in the ready state. Any one of these processes could use the processor next. It is up to the short-term scheduler to pick one. Generally, this is done with a round-robin algorithm giving each process some time in turn. Priority levels may also be used. Finally, there is an I.O. queue for each I.O. device. More than one process may request the use of the same I.O. device. All processes waiting to use each device are lined up in that device's queue. So another figure is we have 8.11, so queuing diagram representation of process or scheduling. 
So this figure suggests how processor progress through the computer under the control of the OS. Each process request, may it be batch job, user-defined interactive job, is placed in the long-term queue. As resources become available, a process request becomes a process and is then placed in the ready state and put in the short-term queue. The processor alternates between executing OS instructions and executing user processes. While the OS is in control, it decides to which process in the short-term queue should be executed next. When the OS has finished its immediate tasks, it turns the processor over to the chosen process. As mentioned earlier, a process being executed may be suspended for a variety of reasons. If it is suspended because the process requests I.O., then it is placed in the appropriate I.O. queue. If it is suspended because of a timeout or because the OS must attend to a pressing business, then it is placed in the ready state and put into the short-term queue. So finally, we mentioned that the OS also manages the I.O. queues. When the I.O. operation is completed, the OS removes the satisfied process from the I.O. queue and places it in the short-term queue. It then selects another waiting process, if any, and signals for the I.O. device to satisfy that process's request. So as you can see here, for the depiction of the diagram representation of processor scheduling, so all process will be put here in long-term queue. And if it is uh, ready to be uh, executed by the uh, processor, it will be transferred to short-term queue. And then if the, uh, if the processing of the process is not yet finished, it will go to either to the I.O. queue, to different uh, levels of I.O. queue. But if the process is finished, depending on the time limit of the processor, then... Uh, it will exit the processor and not going to line up again in the I.O. queues. Okay, so we have, next is another figure, 8.12. So it is all about the use of swapping. So main memory could be expanded and so be able to accommodate more processes. But there are two flaws in this approach. First, main memory is expensive even today. Second, the appetite of programs for memory has grown as fast as the cost of memory has dropped. So larger memory results in larger processes, not more processes. As we can see, um, the processes nowadays are too big compared of the earlier operating systems. So this, uh, so the statement, larger memory results in larger processes, not more processes. So another solution is swapping, so depicted in this figure. So we have letter A, simple job scheduling, and then we have the swapping if there is not enough space for the main memory. So we have a long-term queue of process requests typically stored on disk. These are brought in one at a time as space becomes available. As processes are completed, they are moved out of main memory. Now the situation arises that none of the processes in memory are in the ready state or such as all are waiting for an I.O. operation. Rather than remain idle, the processor swaps one of the processors back out to disk into an intermediate queue. This is a queue for existing processes that have been temporarily kicked out of memory. The OS then brings another process from the intermediate queue or it honors a new process request from the long-term queue. So execution then continues with the newly arrived processes. Swapping, however, is an I.O. operation and therefore, there is the potential for making the problem worse, not better. But because disk I.O. is generally the fastest I.O. on a system, compared with tape or printer I.O., swapping will usually enhance the performance. A more sophisticated scheme involving virtual memory improves performance over simple swapping okay so we have this one for for a simple job scheduling we only have the long-term queue in the disk storage but for swapping we have the long-term queue and then intermediate queue and then uh, if you're going to swap a process it will be put in the intermediate queue and of course if it is already finished processing it will be evicted from the main memory because the process is already finished in execution, just like with simple job scheduling. 
Okay, next is we have another figure. So, example of fixed partitioning of a 64 megabyte memory. So, the simplest scheme for partitioning available memory is to use fixed size partitions as shown in this figure. Note that although the partitions are of fixed size, they did not be of equal size. When a process is brought into memory, it is placed in the smallest available partition that will hold it. Even with the use of an equal fixed size partition, there will be wasted memory. In most cases, a process will not require exactly as much memory as provided by the partition. For example, a process that requires 3 megabytes of memory would be placed in the 4 megabytes partition, such as in figure 8.13b. Okay, we, uh, wasting 1 megabyte that could be used by, the, uh, by other process. A more efficient approach is to use variable size partition. When a process is brought into memory, it is allocated exactly as much memory as it requires and no more. So, um, speaking with uh, partitioning, so next figure, we have 8.14. It is all about the effect of dynamic partitioning. So, an example, using 64 megabytes of main memory, as shown in this figure. Initially, main memory is empty, except for the OS, so for we have letter A. And then, first three processes are loaded in, starting where the OS ends and occupying just enough space for each process. We have B, C, D, as three processes are occupying already the main memory plus the operating system. So this leaves a hole. So this is the hole that we are talking about. At the end of the memory, that is too small for a port fourth process. At some point, none of the processes in memory is ready. So what will happen with the three processes is it will swap out process two. So it will swap out process two, which leaves sufficient room to load a new process, which is process four. So, since process 4 is already fitted here, so that's why it's already uh, in here, in the space that is left behind by process 2. Because process 4 is smaller than process 2, another small hole, so this one, is also created. Later, a point is reached at which none of the processes in main memory is ready, but process 2 in the ready suspend state is available. Because there is insufficient room in memory for process 2 because process 2 wants to come back, the OS swaps process 1 out. So that's why uh, process 1 is evicted in the main memory and swaps process 2 back in. So what happens here is there's already a hole in process 4 and there's also a hole in process 2. So before we consider ways of dealing with the shortcomings of partitioning, we must clear up one loose end. So from this figure, it should be obvious that a process is not likely to be loaded into the same place in the memory each time it is swapped in. Further, if compaction is used, a process may be shifted while in main memory. A process in memory consists of instructions plus data. The instructions will contain addresses for memory locations of two types, such as addresses of data items addresses of instructions used for branching instructions, but these addresses are not fixed. They will change each time a process is swapped in. To solve this problem, a distinction is made between logical addresses and physical addresses. So the definition of a logical address is expressed as a location relative to the beginning of the program. Instructions in the program contain only logical addresses, while physical address is an actual location in main memory. When the processor executes a process, it automatically converts from logical to physical address by adding the current starting location of the process, called its base address, to each logical address. This is another example of a processor hardware feature designed to meet an OS requirement. The exact nature of this hardware feature depends on the memory management strategy in use. And then... We will have to see these examples in the later chapter of our course. So next is we have another figure, figure 8.15, which is all about allocation of free frames. 
So both unequal fixed size and variable size partitions are inefficient in the use of memory. Suppose, however, that memory is partitioned into equal fixed size chunks that are relatively small and that each process is divided into small fixed size chunks of some size, then the chunks of a program known as pages could be assigned to available chunks of memory known as frames or page frames. At most, the wasted space in memory for that process is a fraction of the last page. So in this figure shows an example of the use of pages and frames. At a given point in time, some of the frames in memory are in use and some are free. And then the list of free frames is maintained by the OS as indicated here. So for here, the free is 13, 14, 15, 18, and 20. And process A stored on disk consists of four pages. So when it comes to Time, it would comes a time to load this process, the OS finds four free frames and loads the four pages of the process A into the four frames. So that's why we have uh, 13, 14, 15, page 1 of A, 2, 3, and then since the free space is in 18 frame, so we have here another part of process A. Okay, next is we have figure 8.16, which is all about logical and physical addresses. So now suppose, as in this example, there are not sufficient unused contiguous frames to hold the process. Does this prevent the OS from loading A? The answer is no, because we can once again use the concept of logical address. A simple base address will no longer suffice. Rather, the OS maintains a page table for each process. The page table shows the frame location for each page of the process within the program. Each logical address consists of a page number and relative address within the page. Recall that in the case of simple partitioning, a logical address is the location of a word relative to the beginning of the program. The processor translates that into a physical address. With paging, the logical to physical address translation is still done by the processor hardware. The processor must know how to access the page table of the current process. Presented with a logical address, which has the page number, relative address, the processor uses the page table to produce a physical address, which is the frame number and relative address. So this example is shown in this figure. We have the logical and the physical address. So this approach solves the problems raised earlier. Main memory is divided into many small equal size frames. Each process is divided into frame size pages. Smaller processors require fewer pages. Larger processes require more. When a process is brought in, its pages are loaded into available frames and a page table is set up. So that is all about the logical and physical addresses. And next is we have virtual memory. So with the use of paging, truly effective multiprogramming systems came into being. Furthermore, the simple tactic of breaking a process up into pages led to the development of another important concept, which is about virtual memory. So to understand virtual memory, we must add a refinement to the paging scheme just discussed. That refinement is demand paging, which simply means that each page of a process is brought in only when it is needed that is on demand. Consider a large process consisting of a long program plus a number of arrays of data. Over any short period of time, execution may be confined to a small section of the program, which is a subroutine, and perhaps only one or two arrays of data are being used. This is the principle of locality, which is introduced. And then... It would clearly be wasteful to load in dozens of pages for that process when only a few pages will be used before the program is suspended. We can make better use of memory by loading in just a few pages. Then, if the program branches to an instruction on a page not in main memory, or if the program references data on a page not in memory, a page fault is triggered. This tells the OS to bring in the desired page. Thus, at any one time, only a few pages of any given process are in memory, and therefore more processors, processes rather, can be maintained in memory. Furthermore, 
Time is saved because unused pages are not swapped in and out of memory. However, the OS must be clever about how it manages the scheme. When it brings one page in, it must throw another page out. This is known as page replacement. If it throws out a page just before it is about to be used, then it will just have to go get that page again almost immediately. Too much of this leads to a condition known as thrashing. The processor spends most of its time swapping pages rather than executing instructions. The avoidance of thrashing was a major research area in the 1970s and led to a variety of complex but effective algorithms. In essence, the OS tries to guess, based on recent history, which pages are least likely to be used in the near future. So a discussion of uh, page replacement, because uh, we are here in computer organization and architecture, a broad sense, uh, there is a separate uh, book for operating systems. And then next is we have a potentially effective technique is least recently used, LRU, the same algorithm discussed in Chapter 4 for cache replacement. In practice, LRU is difficult to implement for a virtual memory paging scheme. Several alternative approaches that seek to approximate the performance of LRU are in use. And then with demand paging, it is not necessarily to load an entire process into main memory. This fact has a remarkable consequences. It is possible for a process to be larger than all of main memory. So one of the most fundamental restrictions in programming has been lifted. Without demand paging, a programmer must be acutely aware of how much memory is available. If the program being written is too large, the programmer must devise ways to structure the program into pieces that can be loaded one at a time. With demand paging, that job is left to the OS and the hardware. As far as the programming is concerned, he or she is dealing with a huge memory, the size associated with disk storage. So because a process executes only in main memory, that memory is referred to as real memory. But a programmer or user perceives a much larger memory that is which is allocated on the disk. So this latter is therefore referred to as the virtual memory. And then virtual memory allows for very effective multi-programming and relieves the user of the unnecessarily tight constraints of main memory. So actually virtual memory is the free space of your hard disk drive. So that's why you have to maintain a certain amount of free space on your hard drive because if, we'll, if it's not enough, the computer will um, complain that the this computer system has a very low virtual memory. Okay, next is we have the figure 8.16. Um, again, all about the uh, logical and physical addresses. So we have um, the basic mechanism for reading a word from memory involves a translation of a virtual logical address consisting of page number and offset into a physical address consisting of frame number and offset using a page table. So because the page table is of variable length, Depending on the size of the process, we cannot expect to hold it in registers. Instead, it must be in main memory to be accessed. So this figure suggests a hardware implementation of this scheme. When a particular process is running, a register holds the starting address of the page table for that process. The page number of a virtual address is used to index that table and look up the corresponding frame number. This is combined with the offset portion of the virtual address to produce the desired real address. So in most systems, there is one page table per process, but each process can occupy huge amounts of virtual memory. For example, in the VAX architecture, each process can have up to 2 raised to 31 or 2 gigabytes of virtual memory. Using 2 raised to 9 512 byte pages, that means that as many 2 raised to 22 page table entries are required per process. Clearly, the amount of memory devoted to page tables alone could be unacceptably high. To overcome this problem, most virtual memory schemes store page tables in virtual memory rather than real memory. This means that page tables are subject to paging just other pages are. When a process is running, at least a part of its page table must be in main memory, including the page table entry of the currently executing page. 
Some processors make use of a two-level scheme to organize large page tables. In this scheme, there is a page directory in which each entry points to a page. Thus, if the length of the page directory is x, and if the maximum length of a page table is y, then a process can consist of up to x times y pages. Typically, the maximum length of a page table is restricted to be equal to one page. So next is we have another figure, 8.17, um, inverted page table in st structure. So an alternative approach to the use of one or two level page table is the use of an inverted page table structure as shown in the figure. Variations of this approach are used in PowerPC, UltraSpark, and the IA64 architecture. An implementation of the Mac OS on the RTPC also uses this technique. So in this approach, the page number portion of a virtual address is mapped onto a hash value using a simple hashing function. The hash value is a pointer to the inverted page table, which contains the page table entries. There is one entry in the inverted page table for each real memory page frame rather than one per virtual page. Thus, a fixed proportion of real memory is required for the tables regardless of the number of processes or virtual pages supported. Because more than one virtual address may map into the same hash table entry, a chaining technique is used for managing the overflow. The hashing technique results in chains that are typically short between one and two entries. The page table structure is called inverted because it indexes page table entries by the frame number rather than by the virtual page number. So another figure is we have figure 8.18. Operation of paging and translation look aside buffer. So we have a flow chart. Okay, so translation look aside buffer or TLB. So in principle, then every virtual memory reference can cause two physical memory accesses. One to fetch the appropriate page table entry and one to fetch the desired data. Thus, a straightforward virtual memory scheme would have the effect of doubling the memory access time. To overcome this problem, most virtual memory schemes make use of a special cache for special for page table entries, usually called a translation look aside buffer or TLB. So this cache functions in the same way as a memory cache and contains those page entries that have been most recently used. So in this figure, it is a flowchart that shows the use of the TLB. By the principle of locality, most virtual memory references will be to locations in recently used pages. Therefore, most references will involve page table entries in the cache. So studies of the VAX TLB have shown that this scheme can significantly improve performance. So next figure is we have the translation look aside buffer and the cache operation. So note that the virtual memory mechanism must interact with the cache system and not the TLB cache but the main memory cache. So this is illustrated in this figure. A virtual address will generally be in a form of a page number offset. First, the memory system consults the TLB to see if the matching page table entry is present. If it is, the real or the physical address is generated by combining the frame number with the offset. If not, the entry is accessed from a page table. Once the real address is generated, which is in the form of a tag and a remainder, the cache is consulted to see if the block containing that word is present. If so, it is returned to the processor. If not, the word is retrieved from main memory. So the reader should be able to appreciate the complexity of the processor hardware involved in a single memory reference. The virtual address is translated into a real address. This involves reference to a page table, which may be in the TLB, in main memory, or on disk. The reference word may be in cache, in main memory, or on disk. In the latter case, the page containing the word must be loaded into main memory and its block loaded into the cache. In addition, the page table entry for that page must be updated. So, so much for this. Is, next is we have segmentation. So, there is another way in which addressable memory can be subdivided, known as segmentation. 
Whereas paging is invisible to the programmer and serves the purpose of providing the programmer with a larger address space, segmentation is usually visible to the programmer and is provided as a convenience for organizing programs in data and as a means for associating privilege and protection attributes with instructions in data. So segmentation allows the programmer to view memory as consisting of multiple address spaces or segments. Segments are of variable, indeed dynamic size. Typically, the programmer or the OS will assign programs and data to different segments. There may be a number of program segments for various types of programs as well as a number of data segments. Each segment may be assigned access and usage rights. And then memory references consist of a segment number offsets form of address. So this organization has a number of advantages to the programmer over a non-segmented address space. First, it simplifies the handling of growing data structures. If the programmer does not know ahead of time how large a particular data structure will become, it is not necessarily to guess. The data structure can be assigned in its own segment and the OS will expand or shrink the segment as needed. Second, it allows programs to be altered and recompiled independently without requiring that an entire set of programs be relinked and reloaded. Again, this is accomplished using multiple segments. And then third, it lends itself to sharing among processes. A programmer can place a utility program or a useful table of data in a segment that can be addressed by the other processes. Fourth advantage, it lends itself to protection. Because a segment can be constructed to contain a well-defined set of programs or data, the programmer or a system administrator can assign access privileges in a convenient fashion. So these advantages are not available with paging, which is invisible to the programmer. On the other hand, we have seen that paging provides for an efficient form of memory management. To combine the advantages of both, some systems are equipped with the hardware and OS software to provide both the segmentation and paging. Okay, so we have uh, delved with next is the Intel X86 memory management. So the X86 includes hardware for both segmentation and paging. Both mechanisms can be disabled, allowing the user to choose from four distinct views of memory. First is we have the unsegmented and paged memory. In this case, the virtual address is the same as the physical address. This is useful, for example, in low-complexity, high-performance controller operation. Then next is we have unsegmented paged memory. Here, memory is viewed as a paged linear address space. Protection management of memory is done via paging. This is favored by some operating systems such as the Berkeley Unix. And then another one is we have the segmented unpaged memory. Here, memory is viewed as a collection of logical address spaces. The advantage of this view over a paged approach is that it affords protection down to the level of a single byte if necessary. Furthermore, unlike paging, it guarantees that the translation table needed or the segment table is on chip when the segment is in memory. Hence, the segmented and page memory results in predictable access times. And last but not the least is we have the segmented paged memory. Segmentation is used to define logical memory partition subject to access control and paging is used to manage the allocation of memory within the partitions. So operating systems such as Unix System 5 favor this view. So to continue our discussion with segmentation, so when segmentation is used, each virtual address or called uh, logical address in Pentium 2 documentation consists of a 16-bit segment reference and a 32-bit offset. Two bits of the segment reference deal with the protection mechanism, leaving 14 bits for specifying a particular segment. Thus, with unsegmented memory, the user's virtual memory is 2 raised to 32 or 4 gigabytes. With segmented memory, the total virtual memory space as seen by a user is 2 raised to 46 or 64 terabytes. The physical address space employs a 32-bit address for a maximum of 4 gigabytes. 
the amount of virtual memory can actually be larger than the 64 terabytes. This is because the processor's interpretation of a virtual address depends on which process is currently active. Virtual address space is divided into two parts. One half of the virtual address space, or the 8,000 segments times 4 gigabytes is global, shared by all processes. The remainder is local and is distinct for each process. Okay, next is we have segment protection. So associated with each segment are two forms of protection. We have privilege level and access attribute. There are four privilege levels from most protected level, which is level 0, to least protected level, level 3. The privilege level associated with the data segment is its classification. The privilege level associated with the program segment is its clearance. An executing program may only access data segments for which its clearance level is lower than or more privileged or equal to or same privilege level of the data segment. The hardware does not dictate how these privilege levels are to be used. This depends on the OS design and implementation. It was intended that privilege one or privilege level one would be used for most of the OS and level zero would be used for that small portion of the OS devoted to memory management, protection, and access control. This leaves two levels of applications. In many systems, application will reside at level three with level two being unused. Specialized applications and subsystems that must be protected because they implemented their own security mechanisms are good candidates for level two. Some examples are the database management systems, office automation systems, and software engineering environments. In addition to regulating access to data segments, the privilege mechanism limits the use of certain instructions. Some instructions, such as those dealing with memory management registers, can only be executed in level 0. I.O. instructions can only be executed up to a certain level that is designated by the OS. Typically, this will be level 1. So next is we have a figure 8.20 all about the Intel x86 memory management formats. So the address translation mechanisms for segmentation involves mapping a virtual address into what is referred to as a linear address as shown in figure 8.20b. So a virtual address consists of the 32-bit offset and a 16-bit segment selector, which is figure 8.20a. And then the segment selector consists of the following fields. We have the table indicator or TI indicates whether the global segment table or a local segment table should be used for translation. Next is we have segment number, the number of the segment. This serves as an index into the segment table. And then we also have the requested privilege level or the RPL, the privilege level requested for this access. So next is we have another table, table 8.5, the x86 memory management parameters. So this is composed of two pages. So as we have, these are defined. Uh, the fields are defined in uh, table 8.5. So each entry in a segment table consists of 64 bits as shown in figure 8.20c of the previous slide. So these are the segment descriptor for the base. So defines the starting address of the segment within the 4 gigabyte linear address space. And then we have the DB bit. In a code segment, this is the D bit and indicates whether operands and addressing modes are 16 or 32 bits. Then we have the descriptor of privilege level or the DPL specifies the privilege level of the segment referred to by the segment descriptor. And then we have granularity bit or the G indicates whether the limit field is to be interpreted in, in units by 1 byte or 4 kilobytes. Next is we have the limit. So this defines the size of the segment. The processor interprets the limit field in one of two ways, depending on the granularity bit. In units of one byte, up to a segment size of limit of one megabyte or in units of four kilobytes, up to a segment size limit of four gigabytes. And then we have the S bit. Determines whether a given segment is a system segment or a code or data segment. 
Then we have the segment present bit or P used for non-page systems. It indicates whether the segment is present in main memory. For page systems, this bit is always set to 1. And then we have the type distinguishes between various kinds of segments indicated the access attributes and then in continuation in the second page we have the access bit for page directory entry and page table entry so access bit is a this bit is set to one by the processor in both levels of page tables when a read or write operation to the corresponding page occurs and then we have the dirty bit so this bit is set to 1 by the processor when a write operation to the corresponding page occurs. And then we have page frame address. Provides a physical address of the page in memory if the present bit is set. Since page frames are aligned on 4, 000, 4K boundaries, the bottom 12 bits are 0 and only the top 20 bits are included in the entry. In a page directory, the address is that of a page table. And then we have the page cache disabled bit or the PCD indicates whether the data from page may be cached. And then page size bit or the PS indicates whether the page size is 4 kilobytes or 4 megabytes. And then we have the page write through bit PWT indicates whether write through or write back caching policy will be used for data in the corresponding page. And then we have present bit or P indicates whether the page table or page is in memory. And then we have the read-write bit or RW for user-level pages, indicates whether the page is read-only access or read-write access for user-level programs. And then we have the user-supervisor bit or the US, indicates whether the page is available only to the operating system or the supervisor level or is available to both operating system and applications or the user level. So these are the x86 memory management parameters. And then next is we have paging. So segmentation is an optional feature and may be disabled. When segmentation is in use, Addresses used in programs are virtual addresses and are converted into linear addresses as just described. When segmentation is not in use, linear addresses are used in programs. In either case, the following step is to convert that linear address into a real 32-bit address. To understand the structure of the linear address, you need to know that the Pentium 2 paging mechanism is actually a two-level page uh, table lookup operation. The first level is a page directory which contains up to 1,024 entries. This splits the 4 gigabyte linear memory space into 1,024 page groups, each with its own page table and each 4 megabytes in length. Each page table contains up to 1,024 entries. Each entry corresponds to a single 4 kilobyte page. Memory management has the option of using one page directory for all processes one page directory for each process or some combination of the two. The page directory for the current task is always in main memory. Page tables may be in virtual memory. So in the figure 8.20 in the previous figure shows the formats of entries in page directories and page table and the fields are defined in table 8.5. Note that the access control mechanisms can be provided on a page or page group basis. So the x86 also makes use of a translation look-aside buffer. The buffer can hold 32 page table entries. Each time that the page directory is changed, the buffer is cleared. So next is we have figure 8.21, the Intel x86 memory address translation mechanisms. So this figure illustrates the combination of segmentation and paging mechanism. For clarity, the translation look-aside buffer and memory cache mechanisms are not shown. Finally, the x86 includes a new extension not found in 8386 or 8486, the provision for two-page sizes. If the PSE or the page size extension bit in control register 4 is set to 1, then the paging unit permits the OS programmer to define a page either 4 kilobyte or 4 megabyte in size. When 4 megabyte pages are used, there is only one level of table lookup for pages. When the hardware accesses the page directory, the page directory entry 
such that in figure 8.20d has the PS bit set to 1. In this case, bits 9 through 21 are ignored and bits 22 to 31 define the base address for a 4 megabyte page in memory. Thus, there is a single single page table. So the use of 4 megabyte pages reduces the memory management storage requirements for large main memories. With 4 kilobyte pages, a 4 gigabyte main memory requires about 4 megabytes of memory just for the page tables. With 4 megabyte pages, a single table, 4 kilobytes in length, is sufficient for page memory management. So this figure is a combination of uh, segmentation and paging mechanisms. So for this one, this is for the segmentation and this is for paging. Okay, another figure. So we have ARM Memory System Overview. So ARM provides a versatile virtual memory system architecture that can be tailored to the needs of the embedded system designer. As you can remember, uh, ARM processors are used not for computers or laptops but rather for mostly they are in mobile phones or embedded systems. So in this figure provides an overview of the memory management hardware in the ARM for virtual memory. So the virtual memory translation hardware uses one or two levels of tables for translation from virtual to physical addresses as explained subsequently. The translation look aside buffer or TLB is a cache of recent page table entries. If an entry is available in the TLB, then the TLB directly sends a physical address to main memory for a read or write operation. So as explained in Chapter 4, data is exchanged between the processor and main memory via the cache. If a logical cache organization is used, as in I uh, can remember in Figure 4.7a, then the ARM supplies the address directly to the cache as well as supplying it to the TLB when a cache miss occurs. If a physical cache organization is used, um, in figure 4.7b, then the TLB must supply the physical address to the cache. Entries in the translation tables also include access control bits, which determine whether a given process may access a given portion of memory. If access is denied, access control hardware supplies an abort signal to the ARM processor. So next is we have the virtual memory address translation. So, aside from what is discussed uh, based on RAM, our ARM, rather, the ARM supports memory access based on either sections or pages, such as super sections, which is optional, consists of 16 megabyte blocks of main memory, and then sections consist of 1 megabyte blocks of main memory. We have large pages, consist of 64 kilobytes blocks of memory. Small pages consist of 4 kilobytes blocks of main memory. And then sections and super sections are supported to allow mapping of a large region of memory while using only a single entry in the TLB. Additional access control mechanisms are extended within small pages to 1 kilobyte subpages and within large pages to 16 kilobyte subpages. The translation table held in ma main memory has two levels. We have first level table hold section and super section translations, and pointers to second level tables. Next is we have second level tables, hold both large and small page translations. The memory management unit or the MMU translates virtual addresses generated by the processor into physical addresses to access main memory, and also derives and checks the access permission. Translations occur as the result of a TLB miss and start with the first level fetch. A section mapped access only requires a first level fetch, whereas a page mapped access also requires a second level fetch. So next is we have another figure, 8.23. We have an ARM virtual memory address translation for small pages. So this figure shows the two-level address translation process for small pages. There is a single level 1 or L1 page table with 4K 32-bit entries. Each L1 entry points to a level 2 or L2 page table with 255 32-bit entries. Each of the L2 entry points to a 4 kilobyte page in memory. The 32-bit virtual address is interpreted as follows. The most significant 12 bits are indexed in, into the L1 page table. The next 8 bits are indexed into the relevant L2 page table. The least significant L2 
12 bits index a byte in the relative page in memory. So a similar two-page lookup procedure is used for large pages. For sections and supersection, only the L1 page table lookup is required. So another figure for ARM is 8.24 ARM memory management formats. To get a better understanding of the ARM memory management scheme, so we consider the key formats shown in this figure. So the control bits shown in this figure are also defined in the next table. So we have three. We have the alternative first level descriptor formats and alternative second level descriptor formats and the virtual memory address formats. So this is the table 8.6 that describes the parts of the ARM memory management parameters. So we have access permission and then access permission extension. So this bit control access to the corresponding memory region. If an access is made to an area of memory without the required permissions, a permission fault is raised. And then we have bufferable bit, which is B, determines with the TEX bits how the right buffer is used for cacheable memory. And then we have cacheable bit or C, determines whether this memory region can be mapped through the cache. And then we have domain, collection of memory regions. Access control can be applied on the basis of domain. And then we have not global NG, determines whether the translation should be marked as global or zero or process specific, which is one. And then we have shared, determines whether the translation is not shared, zero, or shared one memory. And then we have next is SBZ, should be zero. And then type extension TEX. So these bits together with B and C bits control accesses to the cache, how the right buffer is used, and if the memory region is shareable and therefore must be kept coherent. And then we have execute never XN determines whether the region is executable, which is zero or not executable one. Okay, next is we have access control. So the AP access control bits in each table entry controls access to a region of memory by a given process. A region of memory can be designated as no access read only or read write. Further, the region can be designated as privileged access only, reserved for use by the OS and not by the applications. ARM also employs the concept of domain which is a collection of sections and or pages that have particularly access permissions. The ARM architecture supports 16 domains. The domain features allows multiple processors to use the same translation tables while maintaining some protection from each other. So each page table entry and TLB entry contains a field that specify which domain the entry is in. A 2-bit field in the domain access control register controls access to each domain. Each field allows the access to an entire domain to be enabled or disabled very quickly so that whole memory areas can be swapped in and out of virtual memory very efficiently. Two kinds of domain access are supported. We have clients, users of domain, or execute programs and access data that must observe the access permissions of the individual sections and or pages that make up that domain. And then we have managers, control the behavior of the domain or the current sections and pages in the domain and the domain access and bypass the access permissions for table entries in that domain. One program can be a client of some domains and a manager of some other domains and have no access to the remaining domains. This allows very flexible memory protection for programs that access different memory resources. So that is all about the ARM architecture. So we've come to the end of our lesson. So chapter 8 is of course all about operating system support. And then as we have studied, we have the operating system overview. What are the operating system objectives and function, types of operating systems. And then we have scheduling, long term, medium term, and short term. And then the Intel x86 memory management. How about the address space, segmentation, and paging. And then for the memory management, so it can be swapping, partitioning, paging, or by using virtual memory, or having a translation look aside buffer and segmentation. And then we also have for the ARM memory management, the memory system organization of ARM, 
the virtual memory address translation, memory management formats, and access control. So before we end, um, you can, in philosophical point of view, you can view operating system as a soul of a person or, of course, of living, of humans, as, as we can see, because um, our body can only function if we have soul. But if it's not soul, it does not have the soul. Even if you don't have or you have the greatest perfect body, but if you do not have the soul, then it will be meaningless because it, yeah, it will not function. So th that's my take on the operating system. Uh, how are you going to compare operating system in a real world situation? So that's it for the end of my lesson. So please... Don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel and like the video. And I hope that you've learned um, again um, for my lecture about computer organization and architecture. So thank you very much. Good day and stay safe.